Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading A Mighty Muskrat Mystery, The Case of Windy Lake. This book is written by Michael Hutchins and it is published by Second Story Press. We're going to pick up where we left off with Chapter 4, Fishing for Information. She's on a vision quest. Grandpa chuckled as he thought about it. She's picked her, her wild wilderness. What do you mean, Grandpa? Sam asked. They were once again in the old man's house. Chickadee and Sam leaned against the kitchen counter and listened to their elders. Otter and a team, preferring the outdoors, hung around in the yard. The old man looked at his grandson. Well, do you know what a vision quest is? It's a test, Sam said eagerly. A test to see if a child is ready to be an, ad an adult. Vision quests are a seeking of a vision. They are done for many reasons, but the first vision quest can be an important rite of passage. Grandpa paused as he felt a memory from his distant past. Before young people go out on their first vision quest, they are told about the great ones among their people, the heroes in their family, and other important teaching. And they don't get any food or water, Chickadee smiled. That must be tough. Well, it's a test in many ways. After being told the stories, after some time in the sweat lodge, the youngster is put somewhere safe and alone, and there they stay for sometimes four days, and they are given very little, if anything, to drink. Why, Grandpa? For two reasons, I guessed. First, it's about testing your ability to say no to yourself. Finding your vision is something that only the best piece of you can do, so you must first learn to say no to the animal in you. The animal that thirsts, the animal that hungers, the animal that complains when it has to do homework. Grandpa smiled. What's the other reason? Sam pinched his lip as he listened. To prepare you for your vision, which comes from above. Your body is of earth. And what do you see? Sam asked eagerly. Depends on the, the vision that you are seeking. Grandpa was pleased with his grandson's interest. Hopefully on their first vision quest, a young person will see how to contribute to their people to see how their creation-given talents are best able to serve their family and community. And how is Denise on a vision quest, Grandpa? Isn't it usually for boys? Chickadee filled Grandpa's teacup as she spoke. Anyone can search for a vision, but it is true that it is usually a rite of passage for young men. Your cousin has had a rough life, but she has the heart of a leader. It's her struggle that gave her strength. But she's not in the forest, Chickadee was matter-of-fact. No, but she is on her own. She is facing this wilderness alone. She has chosen. Maybe this location is important to her vision. He shrugged his shoulders and then smiled. Your cousin wants to test the company, but that may not be all she gets. The old man chortled. Pops, her uncles rumbled. It isn't funny or spiritual. She's just causing trouble. The old man waved his empty teacup in the, in the air. She's being a voice, he insisted. There's lots of others who think like her, Chickadee said as she refilled her elder's teacup. No, I know, Levi shook his head. The two men sat quietly, looking out over the yard and the lake beyond. Finally, their uncle spoke. Will you talk to her? A person on a vision quest needs to be told of the heroes in our family. Grandpa sounded certain. Uncle Levi paused to say something, but instead he just sighed and then rose to leave. Just convince him to let them cut the tube that's covering her hands. I'll speak to her. Uncle Levi motioned to the kids as he made his way out of the aged house. Sam and Chickadee followed, the door complaining loudly as it closed. This isn't helping finding that missing archaeologist. Hey, Uncle? Chickadee was hoping he'd have some more information about their case. A team and otter came around the corner. No, it isn't. Uncle Levi jumped as the receiver in his truck barked to life. He walked quickly to the vehicle, opened the door, and told the person on the other end to repeat themselves. The radio cackled. We need you back at the base, boss. They may have found that old man. The muskrats perked up and listened carefully. Their uncle noticed their interest and smiled. Well, it looks like your new case may be solved, muskrats. The kids looked at each other, deflated. That's okay, uncle, said Sam, shrugging. We're just happy he's been found. Chickadee looked at the ground, disappointed. Mm-hmm, Uncle smiled, hitching up his belt and rolled into a, rolling into his truck. With a wave, he pulled out of the driveway and drove off. Chickadee shrugged. What are we going to do now? A teen tossed his hair from his eyes. 
Let's go see the station and see what people are saying. That sounds like a good idea. I'm hungry. A team enthusiastically agreed. You're always hungry, Chickadee teased. Do we have any money? Otter pulled a handful of change out of his pockets. A team began to count. That's enough for some fries. Maybe a pop, he said triumphantly. Super. Let's go. The station was far more than a gas station and a garage. It was also one of the four restaurants in the town. And it was one of the focal points of the Moccasin Telegraph. When people were in a teasing mood, they often called it the drama station, but mostly it was just the station. Chickadee breathed in the dusty, oily smell of the garage as they stepped into the gas station and store. Enticed by the prospect of french fries, a team and otter headed for the door leading to the restaurant. Sam scanned the room. He nodded at the teenager who was serving a highway-weary trucker. A few locals shopped on the shelves, but there was nobody he was related to. He followed Chickadee and the others into the restaurant. The jukebox was playing Love Hurts by Nazareth. Scarred and scuffed, blue and once white tiles covered the floor. Signs streamed in from a large window that overlooked the gas pumps, the parking lot, and the trucks buzzing up north the highway. Booths lined the other two walls. Tables and chairs were arranged in a semi-organized way across the checkered floor. Half the restaurant was occupied by First Nation people hunkered over cups of coffee. A few tables held non-local miners and highway travelers. Laughter was coming from most tables and jokes were being shared between a few. The quiet tables held smiling elders. One of the few local miners pointed at the kids and smiled, and then said something which brought a laugh from his fellow employees. Here come the mighty muskrats, the miner teased when they walked in closer. Must be tough working in a mine, Chickadee threw back. Pfft, we're on our week off. Two weeks in, one week out. It's the life. The men laughed. What do you guys know about that old man who got lost? Sam liked a joke, but he was there for a reason. So was the team. I'm going to order our fries, he whispered in Chickadee's ear, before he and Otter walked off to find a table. A duck? He's an idiot. Educated guy, but stupid. I was on a crew that was waiting for him to finish, but I know I'm good. He didn't know the bush. I'm pretty sure he considered us savages. He looked at his buddies as he said the last bit, and they chuckled at the dark joke. Who did work with him? Sam interrupted. This one's always thinking, the local said to his crew, slightly annoyed. Go talk to Ugly Fish. He was with the docks, Gopher. I don't even think he was working for the mine, just doing Gopher stuff for the old man. He's over there. Look. Barry pointed with his lips. Chickadee and Sam looked over to the table where the miner had gestured. Ugly Fish was sitting at a table with his sketchy cousins. Ugly Fish's real name was Mariah which he insisted was from the Bible, but around here, a Mariah was an ugly fish. Most people called him fish, but they added the ugly when they were being mean. Let's wait until he's by himself, Chickadee said to Sam. They said their goodbyes to the miner's table and joined a team in Otter. The fries hadn't yet arrived, and the boys were sharing a can of Coke. Okay, we figured out fish may know something, Sam said as he slid into the booth besides a team. We're going to wait until he's away from the crew before we ask him anything. Chickadee plopped down beside Otter. The muskrats watched Fish's table. The waitress brought the fries with a second plate for Otter. He didn't like ketchup on top. He only liked to dip. The kids began to grab the potato sticks hungrily. The coke was shared. Eventually, Fish started to say goodbye to those he was with. Okay, he's leaving by himself, Chickadee whispered. That's good, eh? A team nudged her. She pushed him back. He may talk more if he's alone, Sam answered a team. Fish eventually lip, limped across the restaurant and out the door. The muskrats gulped down the last of the chips and followed out. Hey, Fish, a team called. The young man turned around to see who called his name. Although Fish was only in his 30s, he seemed haggard. An old boating injury caused him to limp and slouch forward slightly. His hand-me-down clothes didn't fit well. What do you kids want? He began to walk away as he asked the question. Did you hear they found that old man? Sam asked, trailing after him. The dock? That's what we hear. Chickadee chimed in. We also heard you were helping him out with his science. Sam thought flattery might loosen Fish's lips. Yeah, yeah, I was. Took him out to his sights and even to a few others. He was excited about something. Which places? Chickadee tried to sound only vaguely interested. Oh, uh, you know, the tourist sites, the rock paintings along the river, the old winter site, the old fishing weir, a couple of others. 
He thought they were fantastic, Fish laughed. But I heard they didn't find him. Didn't find him? Surprised Sam looked at Chickadee. Who told you that? She probed. Stu brought the RMC, RCMP boat down here on the trailer to fill up its tanks. He said they found the old guy's boat down by the Delta. Said it looked like he just walked into the bush. Fish stopped and turned to see why the kids were suddenly quiet. All he could see was four little clouds of dust as the mighty muskrats disappeared across the parking lot and down the bush trail. Chapter 5. Chuckles at the Cultural Camp The boat pounded against the waves as it cut through the lake. Otter sat at the front. Spray washed his face as the prow bumped against the water. Behind him, his cousin searched wave and shore for signs of another boat. Steering the fishing boat was their older cousin, Mark, who worked with their Uncle Bruce pulling nets. The delta that Fish had spoken of was the mouth of Snake Creek, a thin trickle that occasionally slithered out to form a broad stream when the spring's ra spring rains came. When it was flooded, the fast-moving water picked up a lot of silt. When it dumped that soil at the creek's end, it created a small fan of swamp and mud that slowly pushed into the lake. The delta was about a 90-minute boat ride from town. Mark said he could take the kids as long as they stopped at the cultural camp to drop off some ducks he had shot. Hey, a team yelled and pointed. A traditionalist's camp had just come into view. Not much could be seen, just flashes of color amidst the black and gray trunks of thin evergreens. There were several motorboats pulled up along shore. The landing site was filled with countless multicolored stones, slowly being grounded as sand by the motion of the waves. Mark killed the engine and lifted the prop out of the water. Only the slap of waves could be heard until the pe pebbles began their stumbling scratch as the ground came up to meet the aluminum bow. Otter leapt into the knee-deep clear water with the boat's rope in hand. With the help of the occasional lift from the waves, he pulled the, his cousins further into shore and tied the rope to a tree. Holy, Mark exclaimed. They've been raising the water at the dam. Look what it did to the shore there. The frequent raising and lowering of the lake's water by the nearby hydro dam had eroded the bank of the soil above the now wider strip of pebbled shore. I never had a tie up this high before. Otter looked worried. With everyone disembarked, they began trudging up the hill to the camp. Mark and Otter carried the ducks. The traditionalist's camp was a group of teepees, wigwams, and shacks scattered amongst the trees in the sparse spruce forest. Most of the teepees were painted with the colors and patterns of the people that owned them. A few small cooking fires burned here and there, but the muskrats headed for the fire in the center of camp, where the old men hung out and where most of the visiting took place. Two old couples relaxed in lounge chairs, sipping their tea in the warmth of the flames. Mark, being the oldest cousin, had the responsibility of speaking first. He presented his ducks to the elders. Chickadee touched the arm of one of the older ladies and pulled up a stump of wood near her. Sam smiled at everyone and also sat on a section of tree trunk. A team and Otter went to the nearby pile of firewood. Otter began to cut kindling with an axe as he listened to the conversation. Give two of those ducks to Grace. Her old man is in town, but he's coming back with their kids. A lady elder lip pointed towards Grace's camp. I'll take one. Her husband laughed. I've been craving duck soup. You don't make good duck soup, his wife teased. I didn't say I was craving my duck soup. So whose duck soup are you craving? The old lady pretended to be angry. Are you craving another woman's soup? The elders, Muskrat, and Mark giggled. A quiet moment passed after the chuckling subsided. I hear they found the missing archaeologist by the Delta, Sam offered. What? The old man was suddenly attentive. Sam was a little surprised with the level of focus. Yeah, Fish told us. Said the cops found his boat by the Delta, or someone did. Did you tell your grandfather this? One of the old men poked the fire as he spoke. We didn't have time. Chickadee also felt the tension in her elders. We wanted to check it out. One of the old women leaned forward. Well, we want you to check it out, too. Then come back and tell us what you saw there. Tell us everything. Why do you want to know? Sam felt a little more than idle curiosity. I saw that little old white, white man wearing his blazer in the bush. The wrinkled elder shook his head. It sounds funny of us, funny to think of him as dangerous, but to us, those bone diggers can be worse than the miners. They want to turn our sacred places into money-making ventures like nobody else. If the miners want our sacred land, it's usually a con by coincidence, but the bone digger makes money from us. 
our stories, our ancestors' places. I know about the old camp and the old dancing site. Do you mean places like those? Chickadee felt like they were on the edge of a secret. Yes, places like those. The old people shared a glance. There's nothing that I know of by the Delta, Chickadee pushed. The old woman besides Chickadee gave her a nudge. With a gentle smile, she said, maybe you haven't earned that knowledge yet. That put an end to the questions. Be careful as you go, young ones. One of the elders stood. It's getting late in the day. If you cannot get back to us, don't worry. Tell your grandfather. We'll hear about it eventually. With quick goodbyes and promises to return, the muskrats and Mark were soon leaving the community fire and making their way back to the boat. Otter pushed them off the shore and they were soon pounding across the waves. Chapter 6. A Rope Points the Way. As they approached the Delta, the muskrats could see an RCMP patrol boat with its front end pushed lightly into the mucky silk and the First Nations police boat bobbing just offshore. An old gull was stuck in the mud a short distance away from the open water. It was the fishing boat that was sometimes rented out by the Matisse, Matisse fisherman, Mr. Mackey. Sam said to no one that must have been the archaeologist's ride. Mark cut the motor and Otter and a team pulled out the paddles to slow the boat's coasting. Don't worry, boys. These waves and currents will push us up onto the soft mud. The hard part will be getting out. Mark kept an eye on the Windy Lake's floating police cruiser. Howdy, he yelled at the officer in the boat. The band constable, Gus, was an old friend of Uncle Levi and their family. Hey, what are you kids doing here? We heard they found that company, man. Sam shaded his eyes from the sunlight as he spoke. Found his boat, one of the boat Mackie rented him, but we've no idea where he is. A wood match danced from side to side in Gus's mouth. No tracks? Team leaned his head to get the hair out of his eyes and pointed at the rocky shore about a football field away from where they were parked on the edge of the Delta stilt. Delta's silt. There must have been some, but in this muck, they disappear. It's practically quicksand, but he did get out. The shore rope was pulled out across the muck. A black and yellow nylon rope would usually secure the rental boat to shore. It was instead stretched out to its full length across the mud. It looked like someone had tried to pull the yawl towards the distant rocks. How do you know that he didn't sink? Sam looked over the bow. The bow. At this point, we don't. Gus studied the mud between the boat and the further shore. Your uncle's on the way with a dog, and Jerry's out there now with the probe. Jerry was the RCMP officer from the patrol boat on the Delta. He was wearing hip waders that went up to his armpits, which was a good thing, because he sank up to his waist in the silty mud. He probed the area around the rental boat with a long rod. An older officer directed him from within the patrol boat. Sam leaned towards Chickadee. There isn't any mining stuff anywhere near here. I was thinking of that. I know the stink pits are back there, but Grandpa's never shown me anything other than that. Sam shook his head to indicate he'd never been introduced to anything sacred or culturally significant in this area either. Otter, he ever take you anywhere special back in the bush? Otter shook his head. He was the most bush savvy of the muskrats. His grandfather used, to, used him as a fire keeper during the sweat lodge and other ceremonies when the older cousins weren't around. They sat in silence and watched the RCMP officer struggle in the muck. Look at that. That's why there's no tracks. It just sucks them up. Gus shook his head. Did you check the hard shore? The team looked in the direction of the distant rocks. Well, we hope the dog will pick up something over there, but if not, we'll need volunteers to walk the bush. Gus's tone suggested that he didn't want to go that far. In the distance, the approaching drone of a boat motor could be heard. The group turned to see who was coming. Uncle Levi had just cleared the last point of land between them and the rest of the lake. Good, the dog. Gus went to the other end of his boat to tell the federal cops. Are we going to get in trouble for being here? Mark looked at the muskrats. He had been unwittingly pulled into their adventures before, and it hadn't always gone well for him. As one, the muskrats shrugged. They watched the approaching boat. Eventually, Uncle Levi slowed his engine to coast towards them. He seemed more annoyed than angry when he noticed the young ones. The muskrats sighed with relief. They could work with annoyed. Sam looked at Chickadee and gave her a nod. Chickadee went to the back of the boat. In a sing-song voice, she said, Hi, Uncle. Did you bring Scout? Frantically, the German Shepherd bounced back and forth around the slowly moving patrol, book, tr patrol boat. How did you know? Uncle Levi chuckled. He tried unsuccessfully to calm the dog. 
Frantically, the German Shepherd continued to bounce, and they all laughed. Uncle Levi steered a slow-moving boat past them so he could speak to the RCMP. How's it going, fellas? It's tough slogging. The older policeman seemed to welcome the conversation. The younger officer looked up at Superior, standing in the boat with consternation, shook his head, and then continued to struggle in the silt. Well, we're going to go with the dog back over there, Uncle Levi pointed along the rocky shore, where we can pull the boats up on solid land, then we'll follow the shoreline and see if we can pick up a scent. After some further small talk with the RCMP and Gus, Uncle Levi restarted his engine and slowly pulled away from the shore. You three, he lit pointed to Mark, Sam, and Chickadee. Go tell the elders and grandfather that we may need volunteers. Tell them to wait till I call, but to have their people ready. He pulled his boat alongside theirs. You two come with me. He motioned to a team in Otter. The two boys hopped into their uncle's boat and smiled back at their cousins. The muskrats were excited to be given jobs by their uncle. Okay, go. Uncle Levi chuckled. He pushed the throttle and the powerful police boat surged into the waves. Mark waved at Gus. You heard the man, we're out of here. As Mark started the engine and slowly steered away, Chickadee and Sam watched the older RCMP officer struggle to stay clean as he attempted to help the younger officer into the boat. Chapter 7, The house Restaurant. Back on the res after talking to the elders in the cultural camp, Chickadee and Sam felt Grandpa's house locked up, found his Grandpa's house locked up and his truck gone. Where do you think he is? Sam asked. Chickadee shrugged. Let's head to the station, but stop at the house restaurant on the way. If the station was the intersection of gossip in the area, the house restaurant was the heart of secondhand information on the res. The eatery's owner and chief, Mavis, had moved into her basement and turned her house into a coffee shop. Her dining room and living room were filled with mismatched tables and chairs. A large freezer hummed in the corner. Music was supplied by a portable CD player, its speakers mounted in the upper corners of a wall. A floor model TV painted fuzzy pictures of the urban world across its screen. A, t a bell tinkled as the kids opened the door. The house restaurant was empty. The sound of the bell brought Mavis up from downstairs. What are you two up to? She asked the kids. She motioned with a cigarette to her usual spot near the kitchen. The table held an ashtray, a cribbage board, and a weathered deck of cards. The usual condiments were lined up on the end of the by the wall. We're looking for Gramps. Sam sat down as he spoke. Do you want coffee? Mm, just some water, Chickadee said. Sam nodded. Mavis poured two glasses of water at her kitchen sink and then brought them back. She lowered her sizable bulk into the chair and flicked her smoke into the ashtray. Pretty quiet so far today. What have you muskrats been doing? Mavis studied the kids. She was a good listener, so people talked to her. She knew everything on the res. I found that old man's boat, Sam announced with a grin. Did they find him? Not yet. Chickadee gulped air as she finished a slug of water. Hmm, Mavis shifted in her chair. Where's the boat? Out by the Delta, Chickadee offered. The kids knew that they had to give her something big if they wanted to find out anything in return. They might be looking for volunteers soon. Sam knew that this was official information Mavis could spread. It was a sizable pelt of gossip. Not sort of interesting. Mavis feigned a lack of interest. People will want to help out. Well, they should wait until Uncle Levi gives him the go-ahead. He's out by the snake pits with a dog right now. Hopefully he'll find the bone digger. If they do need volunteers, they may need to hire boats to take him out there. The kids could see the wheels turning in the restaurant owner's head. The old people seemed kind of freaked out about it when we told them. Sam watched for a reaction from Mavis. Not sure why they'd be worried about a bunch of snakes. Yeah, isn't it just the snake pits out there? Chickadee asked no one in particular. Particular. Mavis wriggled in her chair. The kids knew it always took her a while to pull up the good gossip. Something inside wanted to get out when she shifted around like that. That's why we went to find Gramps. We wanted to ask him if there's anything special out there. Sam knew that Mavis loved to be the first to tell a secret. Mavis took a drag of her smoke and leaned forward. Although no one else, else, else was in the place, and she spoke quietly. Okay, don't tell anyone I told you this. The two muskrats looked at each other and smiled. That was how Mavis started her best gossip. Those old people, they want to keep everything secret. Why? Maybe the town could be making money off those secret places if they weren't afraid of letting people know what they are. The kids nodded reassuringly, so she continued. 
But old rabbit man, back when he used to drink, came in here one night and talked about what he called the refuge. Pretty sure he said it was out past the snake pits. The muskrats looked at each other, slightly surprised that there might be some truth to their speculation. I've never asked the old people about it. They probably give old rabbit man heck, so I never did. She shrugged her shoulders. Well, that sounds like it might be something. Chickadee was already heading for the door in her mind. Maybe it was his phone dialing finger was twitching. We still need to find our grandpa and tell him the news, so we better get going. Sam's chair screeched against the rough wood of the bare floor as he stood. With hurried goodbyes, the kids left the house to haunt. Maybe waved to them with phone in hand. The kids began to walk in the direction of the station. So there is something important back there. It must be really special for the elders to keep it from everybody. Well, most people. Sam speculated out loud. Yeah, Grandpa didn't even tell us. Chickadee sounded a little betrayed. Well, you know, he's always been about how he's always been about earning things, even knowledge. Maybe this is one of those things. Otter said even he didn't know about it, and he's really trying to learn. I'm trying to learn. Chickadee's anger flashed. Sam gave her a little punch. Come on, cuz. You know you spend too much time on that computer. Okay, that's true. But things like this make me wish... Yeah, I know. Sometimes you don't know that there's a deeper level. It was getting dark by the time the kids got to the station. This is where the after dinner crowd, the miners, gathered to talk about their day. It was usually just the working guys, but this time a table of those big bosses sat in the middle. Chickadee and Sam recognized Mr. Makowski, and from the glint in his eye, they could tell that he recognized them too. After a quick look around, the muskrats went to leave. Hey, you kids! Mr. Mikowski babbled across the room. All eyes turned to Sam and Chickadee. They turned around to look at the man. I hear your uncle found a boat. Yeah, it's the one the archaeologist rented. Sam stepped in front of Chickadee. Well, where's the old man? The manager's voice was filled with scorn. Sam knew the company man wouldn't speak to his uncle this way. My uncle will find him if anyone can. He's a great tracker. Tracker? <laughs> Mikowski chortled. Well, that tracker needs to get his idiot niece off my pier. His voice dripped with anger. After a pause, the kids turned to leave. I wasn't finished talking to you. Sam and his cousin turned back. They wanted to ignore the old man, but respecting their elders was ingrained. Mr. Mikowski spoke with a sneer. I know that Pixton was excited about something. It had nothing to do with the mine. I don't think so, anyway. He enjoyed his craft. Enjoys shook his head. I know those traditionalists would rather sit in the Stone Age than evolve. I wouldn't be surprised if they got rid of that old man. Maybe they did it just to delay our work. He shrugged and looked around the other company men. Who knows? Bunch of savages around this place. Some of the men laughed. Some of them didn't. You finished? Sam glared at Mikowski. You can go. The manager flicked his hand. Sam and Chickadee left the station. Sam took his cousin home before he returned to his parents. They walked in silence and said quick goodbyes. A team was already home when Sam got there and filled him in on what happened out in the bush. The bush. That's where we're going to end today. You'll have to tune in tomorrow to find out what a team and otter found out near the snake pits when we read chapter eight, Searching Near the Snake Pits. We've been reading A Mighty Muskrat Mystery, The Case of the Windy Lake by Michael Hutchins. The Hutchinson. This book is published by Second Story Press. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening. Bye.